Today's message title is not very clever or creative or any of that stuff, but it's just intro or introduction to Philippians, and that's really what it is. So it's not creative or fancy or, you know, clickbait like, ooh, I want to know more. Um, but introduction to Philippians. I'm a big believer in that we need to know the context when we're talking about the Bible. How many of you agree? I mean, context in anything is key, right? Like you talk about something, I don't know, a good example. But for instance, I'll use the Bible. So many people use the Bible out of context to try to support their views that they want to be like, oh, well, the Bible says these things. And one of the verses that's often taken out of context is actually found in Philippians, in Philippians 4.13. It says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And that verse, in a sense, is like, I can do all things. But it doesn't mean you're going to literally turn into a, an eagle, right, where it says, oh, I'm mounted up on wings like eagles. Um, that's in the Old Testament, right? But it's like you're not going to turn into an eagle and fly in the sky. I mean, I suppose if God wanted to do, all things are possible for sure. But that's not what the context is saying. Paul, in that context, will get there in 13 weeks. You know, he's saying that I have learned to be content in any season, that I don't need anything apart from Jesus, that I can be poor and broken in prison and I'm okay. Praise Jesus. He's like, I can be rich, have an abundance and praise Jesus, right? He's saying, I can do all things. And when he says all things, that's what he means. Other Bible verses. People take out of context, right? People will often say things like, um, let's just say they like to support, um, you know, smoking weed, marijuana, pot, whatever you want to say. Oh, well, God made the green herb and he said that it was good. And they take that out of Genesis. And yes, he did say it was good. He said all things were good. But what we see from further context in scripture is that that is not God's desire for us. He says to be sober minded, to be self-controlled. And so we see these things and it's easy to pull things out of context and be like, oh, I love that verse. You know, uh, what's another one is... Uh, this one's, uh, it's not Habakkuk, it's, maybe it is Habakkuk. Um, no, it's Haggai. I don't know, it's one of them. Uh, one of the minor, which one is it? You know what I'm talking about where he says like, oh, you're going to see these things and you wouldn't believe it if you saw it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's either Haggai or Habakkuk. Nobody knows, you don't even know your Bibles. Man, all right, good thing you're here. <laughs> We're going to get into it today. I mean, but he says this and people like want to put it on a t-shirt like, oh, you're going to see this vision from God and it's going to be so good that you wouldn't believe it if you saw it. But the whole context in that thing, what God is saying is you wouldn't believe it if, if you saw it is because God's saying it's going to get so bad, you're not going to believe it. You think that things are bad right now. He's like, it's going to get worse and you're not going to believe it before your very eyes. And context is everything. And so when we talk about God's word, you got to have the context. And so today we're going to get into Philippians. And so we're going to cover a couple verses, literally the first and the second verse of Philippians. And we're going to be in the book of Acts for a lot of our study today. But here's a fun fact about Philippians to kind of prep you for what it's about and, and um, where we're going and what you can hopefully expect is that Philippians is... Aside from the Gospels and the words of Jesus himself, Philippians is the number one book used in biblical counseling sessions. And I think that's important to note is because it's so short and sweet, right? It's four pages in my Bible. Maybe it's three in yours. Maybe it's five in another one, right? But it's very few pages. The Bible is like over a thousand pages. So chances are of you just flipping randomly to Philippians and you're playing Bible roulette. Oh, God, speak to me today. Chances of you hitting Philippians is not going to be very good, right? And so unless you go through the Bible intentionally, you probably haven't read through Philippians. But if you've been in a biblical counseling session, maybe you gave counsel to someone if you're from a ministry background or you have been given counsel, chances are that something from Philippians was mentioned in there, if it was true biblical counseling. Why? Because Paul hits so much of it. And it's not even Paul saying, oh, hey, I want to give you biblical counsel. It's literally Paul looking at the perspective, the circumstances of his life. It's not good. He's going through hardships and trials. Um, I think for any one of us, we'd be like, man, life kind of sucks right now. But Paul has a bigger perspective. And his perspective is this gospel-minded perspective. And he sees all these things. And as he's dealing with them, he's kind of... I don't know, almost commentating on his own situation. He says, pray about all things, right? It's like, don't, um, if, if you're anxious, right? Be pray, 
praying. Now he talks about mindset that actually what's happened to me is a good thing and it's happened to advance the gospel. Um, and there's so much in it. And so what I encourage you to do, not only in Philippians, but any, any book or study that we go through, take notes. Maybe God's going to be speaking to you today. Maybe some of you are like, hey, I need some counseling. I got questions. I need help. Or I mean, a lot of times people are too prideful to say that, but I really believe God is bigger than anything we can even imagine. And he will speak to you through our time in Philippians. And I just encourage you to write it down when he does speak, when he points something out. He convicts you. Maybe he encourages you. You're like, I need that. Hold on to his word because his word, the Bible says, is a sword and the sword that we use for battle. Um, and so we battle the lies of the enemies and, and you just got to you got to know the word. And so I'm excited to get into this. Um, and so Philippians verse one and two. Let's get into this. Philippians verse one, it says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to pause there today because this tells us a lot about the context of what we need to know. Number one, when you want to know about context, what's the Bible talking about? You want to say, well, who's the author? Because that matters. Right? It's like if someone tells you something, you don't know who they are, it often doesn't bear a whole lot of weight, right? Someone's like, hey, you're stupid. You're like, well, I don't even know you. You don't know me, whatever. But if someone close to you that you know says, hey, you're stupid and making a bad decision, all of a sudden you're like, maybe I am going down the wrong path, right? Context matters. Who is the author? Well, right here we see Paul and Timothy. Paul is the primary author, and we'll see, you'll see what I mean. At first, it seems like, oh, they're writing it together. Um, Timothy might have written it down because history tells us that Paul's eyesight was bad and that he often had other people like write and scribe things for him later on. And so maybe Timothy wrote it, but Paul was definitely the one speaking it because he talks about Timothy in the, uh, what do you call it, the second person, third person, whatever. Like He references Timothy. And so we know that Paul is the primary author of this. And it says Paul and Timothy, and it says servants of Christ Jesus. And we'll unpack this here in a, maybe we'll unpack it right now. I don't know. I have so much ammunition for Philippians, like I've overstudied and sometimes that's a problem. Um, but what we see here, it says servants of Jesus. So Paul and Timothy are writing, and I love that it says servants, but if you have a different translation other than the ESV, it will say maybe slaves of Jesus, of Christ Jesus. And now that's a strong word, isn't it? Especially in our day and age, we have all this social justice going on and these um, things going for that, which, you know, may or may not be good. I don't know. Some of it's good. Some of it, I think, is just, I don't know what it is going on. But he uses this term, and now it's slave, um, I think, is the better translation. The ESV, I wish, would have used slave because it gives us the context, because it tells us that they view themselves as slaves to Christ Jesus. Now, back in that day, Old Testament times, people would become slaves for a few reasons. Number one, they're broke and poor, and they would actually enslave themselves. It basically was a job. Hey, you got a farm and a business, and you'll make money. I will give you myself if you will feed my family. Literally, that was how it was done. You didn't go down the street and put in a job application. It was just like, I will be your slave. It wasn't a derogatory term in that sense back then. That was something that people would do. But then there was the more aggressive type, and we see it through Exodus where the Israelites become slaves to the Egyptians, right? And it's more of an oppressive overruling of a people and you will do what we want um, no matter what or you'll die or we will not feed your family and those types of things and so we see that and then it goes into the new testament era which you know is many hundreds of years later after the exodus and and old testament type stuff and the word slave would be oftentimes like it's a bond servant a bond servant would be someone who's like i can leave if i want but i'm choosing to stay you know, it's like, hey, I, I love these people. They take care of me. I'm their slave. It's not that I'm their slave and whatever they want to do will happen, but I care for them and I will subject myself to them because I believe in what they're doing. You understand? It's like they submit themselves willingly under that um, 
slavery. And what they're saying here, Paul and Timothy, is that they are slaves of Christ Jesus. They have given everything and they have submitted themselves willingly. They could go anywhere else. And you know this to be true. You've done this whether you know it or not in your own life, that God gives us free will. You can do whatever you want to do, right? Like, hey, if you want to serve Jesus, praise God, you can do it. But if you want to go live your own way and you want to do what you want, make your own life and pursue happiness and whatever that may be, apart from Jesus, God will let you do it. Are there consequences? Sure, there are, right? But you have free will to do it. And there's this free will aspect here where Paul and Timothy, we're slaves. We have subjected ourselves to Christ Jesus. And it's almost as when Peter says, when Jesus says, do you want to leave too? And Peter says, where else will we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. And I think Paul and Timothy, they're exemplifying that to a degree and they're saying where else would we go what else would we do with our lives other than serve jesus christ and so we see for one that um that paul and timothy are the authors of this now the audience is the next question well who's the audience that matters right what's their context what's going on well it's the church at philippi We'll get into that in a little bit as well. It's the church at Philippi. That would be a general sense, all of the church, every member, right, of the church. But then it says also with the overseers. So like, hey, uh, the pastors, this is not just a letter from Paul to the congregation. It's to the pastors and overseers and the deacons, which would be kind of the servants there as well. And that's kind of the context we see. And we'll build upon this as we go. But now Philippians, we've titled this, um, series advance and I just want you to know I want you to have this mindset as we go through it advance and you might be like advance what it, it's advance the gospel advance the gospel that's the message of Paul not only in this letter right we call it a book Philippians is a book of the Bible which it is but you theological nerds or seminary degree people it's not a book Nick it's a letter I know it's an epistle actually so you're wrong no um, but it's a book of the Bible um, and any letter that Paul has written is gospel-centered, gospel-fueled. He's trying to get us to see things through a gospel perspective. We taught through this, um, when we first started this church, we tried to do an online service. This was in the COVID days, and you know everyone's doing Zoom meetings and stuff, and we're like, well, maybe that's what we'll do, and we tried it, and it kind of was like, what? I don't know, it kind of worked, but it was weird for sure. Speaking to a screen is not... I don't know if you guys ever done it right like literally you're talking to a screen you're like this is weird um and you can't see the audience but then like facebook like oh hey my mom's in the chat or like, like but you can't see anybody you just feel like you're talking to yourself well we tried going through philippians and it was a series that i i called it perspective and because paul wants to change our perspective not from looking at ourselves and our circumstances and that life's about us and us being happy and, and making our name great but it changes our perspective to see the bigger picture that it's all about jesus it's all about the gospel advancing the gospel and so i think as we dive in today this won't be the only time we highlight this but you need to know what the gospel is and i think a lot of us we think well i know what the gospel is right it's jesus and I think that's a good Sunday school answer, right? It's like, okay, yes, it is Jesus, but it's also like more than that. Doesn't that make sense? Like the, the gospel, number one, the gospel means good news. If you guys didn't know that, that's what the word means, good news. And you might say, well, good news about what? And again, the Sunday school answer is, well, it's the good news about Jesus. But to someone out in the world, what does that mean to them? The good news of Jesus. Oh, cool. Like, good for you. Has anyone ever told you that? Like, good for you. That's because they don't understand the good news. Because to understand the good news of Jesus, you have to understand the bad news. People don't like bad news, do they? Right? It's like, oh, I got good news and bad news. What do you want to hear first? Well, usually they'll say bad news so you can leave on a happy ending. But when we're talking about Jesus and sin in a fallen world, people don't want to hear that. You don't tell me that I'm sinful and fallen and that I am some kind of evil creature and being right people don't like to hear that but to understand the good news to appreciate it you got to understand the bad news the bad news is that we live in a broken world i think i don't think anybody would uh disagree right even some of the most 
staunch atheist, I think you could say, isn't something wrong with the world? And they'd say, yes, there is. It's evolution. And we're just waiting for us to evolve to a higher level. Maybe they would say that. I don't know. But there's something wrong with the world. We live in a broken world. We are in a sinful, evil world where sin and evil are quite literally around every corner. Uh, and if you don't believe me, just go out around this next week and just think about things from a gospel-centered mind. Let's pray, God, open my eyes that I could see the truth and the way things are. And you'll start to see deception around everywhere you go. People trying to, in a sense, brainwash you. Just watch some show on Netflix where you just check out, well, I'm not doing anything bad. Well, the enemy has captured your mind and now you binge watch eight hours of your life away watching people who are sinful and evil, adulterous. Let's just be honest. Some of the shows we watch, we're like so into it. Oh, such a good show. And you're like, but they're committing adultery. And like literally, and I can't, I'm not innocent in this. I've watched shows, they hook you and they, but it's evil. It's sinful. It's literally everywhere we look. Sin and evilness is everywhere. But here's more of the bad news is that we are part of all of that. We are sinners, right? We don't do what we should do. We don't live unto God humbly for his glory right? At least not at first, right? We come out of the womb, it's all about us. I want the bottle. I want, you know what I mean? Like the baby, like it's all, they're so selfish. Like, you know. um, and I mean, I think that shows us to a degree, we come out of our mother's womb, literally like self-absorbed. It's all about us. And we're only taught that more and more as we grow and we become self-absorbed and we live in this selfish fallen world. And we are selfish fallen people. Our sin selfishness is proof of our sinful nature and again i don't think anyone likes to be called sinful or broken or evil but let's just be honest we are and as i've told you before at the fervent church my job is to teach god's word to tell you the truth you might not like it that might not sit well with you today but that is god's word if you want to know what does god say he says that all have fallen short of god's glory no one seeks god no not one all like sheep have gone astray and so we are broken and god's word starts to paint this picture in Romans. There's a lot of it, and it paints the picture that the punishment for sin is death. Now, you might say if you're new to Christianity or this is a new concept to you, just hearing about the good news and to understand the good news of Jesus, you understand the bad news that we're sinful and fallen, and you might say, well, the punishment for sin is death. Well, that's a little extreme, don't you think? Are you, have you ever thought that? Maybe you have when you're reading through the Bible, like, God, really? Why? That feels mean and cruel. But what that shows us, what it should show you, is that we don't understand who God is. God deserves all the glory and praise in the universe. It says that creation cries out for him. It says that if we don't praise him, Jesus says literally, the rocks will cry out. Paul says that all creation groans in eager expectation of the coming of the Lord. Like everything in the world is waiting for Jesus' return. We're crying out for him. And so when we say, well, isn't saying that death, it, it, well, that's a little extreme. Well, that just shows us that like we're like, God, you're really not that good. right? God is so holy that to offend him, the punishment is death. And when we say that's too extreme, we don't understand how holy, amazing, majestic, awe-filled awe God is. You know what I'm saying? And so we deserve death. Our sin offends a holy, perfect God. And God is just, he's so much bigger, mightier, creative than anything we can really comprehend. And part of our fallen nature is we worship our selves. We worship, here's our problem. Paul says this actually in Romans. He says that we worship the creature rather than the creator. Right? And you're like, well, I don't worship a creature, right? It's like, well, you worship a created thing, right? Well, that's what it's saying. Like, what do you give your time to? What do you give your money to? What do you give your life to? If you're like, oh, well, I give my life to certain things. And I think a good example, especially now, some of you will hate me, in this, but hey, it's cool, whatever. Sports, okay? Sports. We're like, I don't worship anything. I don't worship creatures. Well, we got all these things. We got the Eagles, right? We got the Panthers. We got the Patriots, who are the best team in the NFL. No, but um, we have, you have teams, and like you literally just look at it again. We're like, well, that's not... Let's not get crazy, Nick. Like, literally, we have stadiums built. 
like you know what I'm talking about like stadiums you ever been to one well, they hold upwards of a hundred thousand people who go there to just roar and yell and raise their voice and you want to tell me that that's not worship I just got to say I disagree I'm not saying God didn't is isn't okay with you enjoying a game I think that's fine but I think when we give our lives over to this stuff we start to see and Paul says man we worship the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever Right? It's like we become so nearsighted that we think that, oh, this is what life is all about. And we start to worship these things, find our identity in things rather than find it in God. Because our, we can't, I don't know, we can't comprehend. And that's part of our sin. In our sin, we can't see the bigger picture. And we worship far lesser things than Jesus. But here's the good news is Jesus came to set us free, right? To give us new life. You know that, I hope. And if you don't, you do today. That he came to set us free and to give us life. And he says, not just life, but life more abundant. The abundant life. The everlasting life, right? Jesus isn't just talking about some little cheap imitation of life. The things that we sell ourselves and our time and efforts for every single day, every week. We give our time and effort for things that we think will bring meaning and purpose to life. Jesus is like, no, I want to give you real abundant, everlasting life. And that's good news. He came to set us free. And the way Jesus did that, and again, this is Church 101, but he humbled himself to become a man. We'll go over that in Philippians 2, not too long from now. But he became a man. Just think about that. God Almighty, creator of the universe, becoming a man. Does that make any sense to you? Other than just God's like, hey, I'm just all, why not? I'm just going to take a stroll. Right? I feel like that would be fine. But Jesus humbled himself. And he came, he said he didn't come to be served, but he came to serve. That doesn't make any sense. If you're the CEO, boss, entrepreneur of a company, you don't go into work early at 5 a.m. to go sweep and mop the floors. Like if you're a, a, some multi-million, billion dollar company, that's literally in an even bigger perspective what God has done. Humbled himself, CEO of the universe, of all creation, right? He doesn't have to mop a floor at all. He could create someone like me and say, hey, that's your job. Jesus came down to humble himself to serve even me. That's crazy to me. God became a man, put on flesh, dwelt among us. That's John 1, 14. But his own crea creation, even you and I, we rejected him, despised him. He lived a sinless life, yet he was arrested and he was betrayed, scourged and beaten, hung on a cross, mocked, laughed at, spit on, and he was murdered. God, Jesus in the flesh. We do believe Jesus is God. Right? He lived all perfectly, yet he was mistreated and murdered. And now you might think again, if you're new to the gospel, well, that's a little intense. Why would God go there? That's too extreme and bloody and gory. But again, it shows us the weight of, of our sin and it shows us the way of the gospel message that God deserves his glory and he will go to all costs to get what is his praise wor uh, worship honor right it's like and he deserves it all and so he goes and that just shows us the weight of sin that he would die on the cross for us it shows us the grandness I suppose of what is at hand and if we think that's too intense, man, it just shows us we don't understand God at all. We don't understand the gospel. If you think the cross was too extreme, then that means you don't think your sin really matters, right? It's like, or you just think God's crazy and he just goes overboard, man. He just, he always does things like, you know, excessively and show, shows us though that we don't really understand it. And this is how serious sin in this broken world is that God came to die for us on a cross, reconciling all things to himself. That's his desire so that he would be the victor, not us. It's not about us. It's about God getting his glory and that he's the only one who gets the glory, praise, and honor. And while the rest of the gospel, I'll get to Philippians here in a minute, but Jesus died, you know, he was murdered. He was taken down. He's put into a tomb one that wasn't even his own. He didn't buy with his own money. It was a borrowed tomb, right? As so a person is like, hey, we'll put him in, into my tomb here. And he was taken down on, from the cross, buried in a tomb. And the tomb was protected, if you remember the story, right? It wasn't just like, hey, put him in a tomb. Like these people were scared of Jesus. 
I don't know what it is. I don't, they were like, I don't quite believe. But he said, hey, destroy this temple. And three days later, it's going to rise from the dead. He talked all this talk about the living uh, after the dead and all this stuff that's really creepy and weird. I don't know where he gets it. He's watching too much Netflix or something. Um, you know, and they protected it. They put guards at the tomb. They put a stone over it. You know that. They put a stone, but they didn't just put a stone over the entrance of the tomb. They sealed it. They'd sealed it, seal it with wax. So it's not just like, oh, let's just go hijack the tomb real quick. Like, first off, this stone probably weighed hundreds of pounds. You ever picked up a stone that was just like the size of a basketball? An atlas stone, maybe? Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? Like strongman competitions. They're not, they're like the size of a basketball. You're like, oh, I got this. It's like, it's 200 pound stone and it takes, a, it might not be 200, but they are some that are that heavy. We're talking about a stone that could cover an entrance for a human body to go in. This would be a big stone sealed to the wall. Not an easy feat to get this thing off. And then it also has guards protecting the tomb, right? No one gets in, no one gets out. This is Area 51, UFO, confidential information. Don't let anybody know about it. And if they find out, kill them on site. I don't know, right? It's like, this is a big deal. Well, on the third day, as Jesus said, he came back to life. He was resurrected from the dead as he said he would, right? This is the beautiful thing about it. Jesus says, no one takes my life from me, yet I lay it down willingly. And if I lay it down willingly, what is he going to do? I'm going to pick it back up again. And I love that. It's just so gangster of Jesus. Like, nobody takes my life. I'm God. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to atone for your sins. I'm going to bury in the grave. You're going to think I'm dead. Three days later, boom, back to life. Just as I said I would. I love that. God doesn't make empty promises. And so he, he's resurrected from the dead. So what does that mean when we talk about the gospel and sin and the good news and the bad news? Well, the bad news, sin deserves death. The good news, Jesus died for us. And he's like, hey, here's my death certificate. You guys can go ahead and use it and you can cover all your sins. He has atoned for our sins, quite literally. In the biggest way possible. It's said that crucifixion is the worst way to die. I don't know if you've heard that before. People who study ways to die. I don't know why you would want that job for one. That's a strange person. Um, but they study it and they say crucifixion is the worst way to die. Why? Because you're suffocating. You're suffocating in your own blood, your own um, bodily, like water starts going into your lungs because you're, you're hanging on a cross. Have you guys heard this before, right? This is how they would die. Sometimes Jesus, I think, he died because he lost all of his blood. It was spilt out for us. He was whipped and beaten so badly, he literally bled to death on the cross. But some people who were not scourged as bad would hang on the cross, you know how long? Literally for weeks at times, where they would be hanging on the Roman road, and they'd just leave them there. And eventually they would die because they'd come up to get a breath of air, come down, and then they just hang there. You're losing your strength little by little by little. Meanwhile, you got nails in your hands, nails in your feet. You are bleeding slowly but surely. But the main way you would die is of suffocation. And then when they wanted to expedite it, they would break your legs so you could no longer push up on your legs to get a breath of air. Now you had to try to pull up on your hands alone, right? And then obviously you would lose strength, right? Some of you, you just think about that. Like, can you even do a pull-up, right? Just imagine having nails through your hands, trying to do a pull-up to get a breath. That's how people would die. And Jesus did that for you and I. His death means forgiveness of our sins, atonement. Our sins are covered if we repent and believe in Jesus. And what does the resurrection mean? Well, it means the path to everlasting abundant life has been paved. That, that there is no, nothing's going to come against it. It's finished. And now all there is for us is that we must repent and believe, right? Repent. We turn from our old ways of living. I used to be a sinner. This is what I used to do. And I, I was fallen. All of us were. Sometimes we beat ourselves up. I can't believe I'd do this and I'd be so selfish and hurt so many people with my sin. That's the thing. Sin hurts everybody around you. You might think it's just my own sin, my own addiction, but it hurts everyone. It hurts everyone. It affects everyone. And you might think, though, like, oh, I'm just, I can't believe I do that. And we beat ourselves up. But the message of the gospel is that Jesus has already been beat up and killed for us. And now we can change our ways, literally repent. This word metanoia is to change our mind that I'm going to live a new life. I'm going to be reborn, right? As Jesus says in 
John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. He says, you got to be born again, born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and be born again there. And then we can start to walk and we believe. And the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead on the third day, that we will be saved. Amen? Amen. And that's part of the gospel. And Philippians, coming back to this, you're like, I thought we were getting Philippians today. Philippians is a letter from Paul and Paul views his life through the gospel. He's so intense, you're like, Paul, you're crazy. You're a Jesus freak if I've ever seen one before. And Paul's like, praise Jesus, right? Like, he's so hardcore. And what I love about it is we might think, man, he's a little intense. It's a little overboard. I would say that we cannot exhaust living for Jesus enough. Life is about Jesus. Our, everything we do, say, is, should be about Jesus. He created us for a relationship with him. And that's what we're awaiting Right? It's like we're in a fallen world. Jesus is going to come against us. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And he's going to restore all things to himself. It's basically going to be Garden of Eden 2.0. Like the Garden of Eden, the first two chapters of Genesis, like that was God's intent. But we messed it up. And, and we sinned and we fall in short and we do what we shouldn't do. But Paul, man, in Philippians, he's a man who views his life through the gospel. But what you need to know about Paul, say in the context, is he wasn't always this way. If you don't know anything about Paul, Paul was the opposite of a Christian. I mean, he was a Jewish person, so I suppose he was close, but he was so far from the truth. And you need to know that Paul wasn't always this way. And so to paint this picture, we're going to go to Acts chapter 6. And we'll have these verses on the screen as well. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. And we're going to get introduced to Paul, but he's known by Saul, and you need to know it. So when he says Saul in these first few things we talk about, that was the old him. Paul is like his new name. Remember in Genesis, we had Jacob, who was then named Israel. Like, that's your old sinful you. And God's like, I'm going to give you a new name. Your name's Israel. It's kind of like that here. Saul, that's your old name. Paul is who you are now. But Acts chapter 6, verse 8, it says, And Stephen, Stephen was a Christian. He was a, a, he was a Jesus freak, okay? He was like um, part of the early church. If you remember Acts, like Acts is literally the uh, story right after Jesus has ascended back into heaven. And now the early church has been somewhat established. Like they're still figuring out this whole church thing. What do we do now that Jesus is gone? And now we've got this Holy Spirit dwelling inside of everyone. This is amazing. But what do we do? We're trying to figure it out. Well, Stephen was a guy on fire. It says, full of grace and power. He was doing great wonders and signs among the people. This is verse 9. And then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the uh, Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and those of Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. So there's an argument going on, to say the least. Verse 10, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. They couldn't stand him. You know, have you ever, like, before you were a believer in Jesus and someone's trying to tell you about Jesus, like, there's just something where you're like, I just can't stand you. Like, I know you're telling me I need to repent and believe in Jesus, and Jesus is going to make all things good, but man, I can't stand you. I don't want to hear that today. Maybe you've never been there. Praise God. But I've been on that receiving end where people are telling me all about Jesus. And for me, it was a, a deep, impactful thing because I didn't want to hear it because I knew it was true. And I think there's something to that to every individual out there who will just try to cast out Christians in the gospel message. They want to put us down, slander us, shame us, shut us up, try to prove us wrong, all that stuff, because something deep within them says that they're right and their pride won't let them agree. Well, anyways, that's happening here um, with Stephen. In verse 11, it says, um, Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. So the people, they don't like Stephen, they don't want to hear it, they start stirring up people. Very much like Jesus, when he was on trial, all of a sudden the Pharisees are going around stirring up the crowds, and Pilate says, what should we do with him? And they say, crucify him. And then all of a sudden someone over there says, crucify him. And you have this whole people just doing what other people are doing. That's happening here with Stephen. Well, let's go skip ahead, Acts chapter 7, 
verse 51 is where we'll pick it up. Stephen, he's given this whole response. I'm skipping over a lot of it, but you should check it out. But he says this, seven, verse, chapter 7, verse 51, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. He's talking about Jesus. And he says, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So Stephen, man, he, you're all, man, I don't know if you should talk right now. You know, Stephen, you might want to chill out. He is unashamed. He puts it out there. You guys are the messed up ones. You killed Jesus. You received the law. You don't keep the law. You're hypocrites is what he's saying. Well, verse 54 goes on. It says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. They're upset, clenching their jaw kind of thing. Verse 55, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. Stephen looks up, he sees the glory of God, says, and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. In verse 56, and he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and rushed together at him. Verse 58, then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So where we get our first introduction to who Paul, the author of Philippians, is. They are persecuting Stephen, a Christian, an unashamed believer of the gospel of Jesus and the power of the gospel. He's about to be stoned and they lay their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Verse 59, and it says, And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen's about to die. And verse 60, it says, And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. It means he died. Stephen died. And then verse 1 of chapter 8, it says, And Saul approved of his execution. Saul, that's Paul. When we're talking about Paul, we're like, man, he's so gospel-centered. He's a Jesus freak. He wrote half of the New Testament. Man, who could ever be like Paul? If we look at his track record, he was the opposite of a Christian. He persecuted the church. It goes on, it says, he approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution. All of a sudden, that day spurred something in the enemy, right? It's like all of a sudden, Stephen's like being bold, and he's willing to die, and saying, Father, forgive them like Jesus did, and all of a sudden, it sparks something, and then now the enemy goes even harder. Saul approved of his execution. There arose a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Verse 2, it says, Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Verse 3, But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, and he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So what is Paul back then? Who is Saul? Well, Saul's the the modern-day equivalent to ISIS, I suppose we could say. You remember ISIS? Um, back, like, right? This way, I mean, I don't know if they're still a thing. I assume they probably are. That, that we could talk about the jihads and stuff. That's a, a religious terrorist is what it is. Because here's the thing about Saul. Saul was somebody. He wasn't just a crazy, messed up guy. Like, Saul was put together. He was somebody. People knew him. People feared him. People, he knew people as well, right? Some people say it's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, Paul knew people. And he also knew a lot himself. Um, we see in Acts 22, Paul's giving a testimony. This is Acts 22, verse 3 and 4. Paul says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus and Cilicia. This is after he's converted, by the way, but he's telling us about his background. He says, I was brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, um, Gamaliel according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way, which would be the gospel, the Jesus, right? It's capital W, right? I persecuted this way. And it says to the death, binding and delivering to prison, both men and women. That's who Paul was. He wasn't just a crazy guy imprisoning people, but he was a guy who studied at the feet of Gamaliel, Gamaliel however you say it. 
But that was, wouldn't be something to just say, oh, he, you know, took an online course and he just got some kind of certificate that made him approve. Like this was some tedious, long studying. Like this would be five to six years is what most scholars will say, that they'd go through this studying where they would learn the Torah, like the first five books of the Bible, front to back, side to side, up and down. They would know it all. Part of their job would be that you need to know this so that you can be a, a Pharisee or a Sadducee, part of the Sanhedrin. You could be part of these people and groups, which were really um, kind of like judges in their day. And they would need to know the law. Part of Paul's background, his his uh, family, well, they were Jewish. Like he was a, he says, and actually Philippians says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Like he's purebred, right? And he's like, my mom and dad, they were Hebrews. They've taught me this way. This is born into him. He feels like he's probably born for this. Goes to this Gamaliel school, learns all about it. And it would tell us that he became part of the, the Sanhedrin at one point, which would be a group of 70 or so um, men who would judge um, these kind of court hearings based on the law of God in the Old Testament. And so he would be a guy, you don't want to argue about Leviticus with Saul, right? This guy knows it, right? It's like, no, actually, it's not verse 18. It's actually verse, you know, he would know it back to back, wouldn't even need to open up the scroll. They didn't have verses back then, but if they did, he would know which one it was. He could quote it um, front to back. He was a prestigious man and... He, uh, he had a good, I suppose, resume in a sense. Another one where we see, this is Philippians 3, verse 4 through um, 6. We'll get to this um, in a few weeks and unpack it more. But he gives more of his resume, his B.C. days. He says, although I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's like, you want to go toe-to-toe and try to one-up me? Like, oh, man, back in the B.C. days, I, was, I had it together. Or I had so much wealth, or I was doing stuff with my life. Paul's like, I was, had more. I was better. He says, I have more. And he says, verse 5, he says, circumcised on the eighth day. That's according to the law. He's all like, man, I was eight days old. I'm already keeping the law, baby. I'm good with God. And he says, of the people of Israel, he was which he was a uh, people of Israel, he says, of the tribe of Benjamin, right? He knows where he's from. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, he was a Pharisee. As to zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, he says he was blameless. Paul was a prestigious, well-studied, smart, zealous man. People knew him. He knew people. And the important thing to note about Paul is that he had it all except Jesus. He, he knew the Old Testament, but he was missing the key that would unlock it. He didn't have the gospel, and the, so he couldn't understand. It's much like walking into a dark room. You guys, anyone who have kids, like you maybe put your kid to bed, or you go in there, and they wake up, right? And you're walking in a dark room, and you just woke up. You can't see very much, and like I said, it's already dark. And then you stumble over things. You step on a car or a Lego. Lego's the worst, right? You wouldn't think it would be, but man, it's dangerous. Um, so small, so deadly. And, and you don't know what you're stumbling over. But then all of a sudden, the light comes on, and you see clearly, oh, it's a Lego, Oh, it's actually a Lego from the Mario set that, you know, and I can start to piece together. That probably came from one of my sons, not my daughter, right? And you can start to see things and you see the perspective clear. That was Paul. He was walking in the darkness. He thought he knew it. He had it together. Then all of a sudden, one day something happened. It changed because he thought he had it all. He was good, prestigious, well-studied, great, good for you. And he tells us, though, he's like, but it's all worthless because once he found Jesus, he realized the truth. The lights came on for Paul. And that ended happening um, for him. Let's go to Acts verse or chapter 9, and we'll see some of the, tran uh, the conversion of Saul to Paul. We'll kind of blast through this at um, a fast speed. But verse 1 of chapter 9 of the book of Acts says, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, 
so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he wants to go on this mission, persecute more people who believe in Jesus because he thinks it's wrong. Something about Paul or Saul, I should say, is that he would have been present for a lot of the beginning of Acts, right? We see Peter and he's making a, uh, I think it's Acts chapter 5, and he's making this um, defense um, in the presence of all, I think it's the Sanhedrin. Um, Paul would have been there. Gamaliel, his teacher, was there. Paul would have been there. He would have heard all this stuff, thought, man, these are blasphemous, messed up people. And that would have just spurred him on. And so he goes to the synagogues, goes to the high priest, asks for these letters that he can persecute him more. Verse 3, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. The lights came on, but he doesn't know all that it is. It's almost like you get blinded by a light and it just kind of disorients you. I feel like that's happening to Paul in a very real way. A light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Before this, he probably thought Jesus is just a made up figure. He was a good guy. Maybe he was a prophet, but man, he certainly isn't God or Lord or Savior of all or the Messiah. And all of a sudden here, he's having this encounter with Jesus. Jesus has blinded him, brought him to his knees. He says, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. Verse 6, he says, but rise, enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do there. Jesus gives him instructions. Jesus is good like that. He'll come into your life. He'll turn the lights on. You feel blinded, disoriented, but he'll say, don't stop there. Keep going. I got more for you. He says, rise, enter the city. You'll be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one, right? You got other guys who are down to go persecute the church. Like, hey, let's go get them, take them to prison, right? All of a sudden, Paul's having an interaction with Jesus himself. Man, that'd be some crazy stuff. But it says, Saul arose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. He was blinded. So they led him by the hand, brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. He's probably trying to wrap his mind around what's going on. If Jesus is real, then everything that I've been taught, everything I've based my life upon up to this point has been a lie or at least skewed to some degree, and I have not been living the truth. He's trying to wrap his mind around this, right? Verse 10 says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord, right? All excited, like, hey, oh God, you got something for me? Cool, here I am. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And as he's seen in a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Verse 13, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. People knew him, right? Wait, Saul? I, hey, I'll do anything, Lord. Okay, well, I need you to go to Saul's house and pray for him. Y'all, no, mm-mm, that guy kills people, right? Stephen was my homie. I ain't going over there, right? Like, wait a minute. I've heard about him, um, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. Verse 14, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I love that he starts with before the Gentiles because, you know, if you would ask Paul or Saul when he was struck with um, a bright light, like, hey, man, um, you think you'll ever minister to the Gentiles? He'd say, absolutely not. That's blasphemous. And don't ever say it again in my sight. Like, literally, that would be the disgust you would have. Being raised, a Gentile is a worldly person. Hebrews. Jewish people, you don't associate with them back then. Um, And so he wouldn't like that, but that's God's plan for him, and God's cool like that. He'll call you to the things that you're like, I will never do that. And he's like, you know what? I got something for you, Um, that thing you said you'd never want to do. Verse 16, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Verse 17, so Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me to you so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, and 
Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. So we see the conversion of Paul here. What's the conversion? It's the acceptance of the gospel, right? All of a sudden, he's like, okay, I think this is real. This is too crazy of a coincidence to happen. I was struck on the road. This guy, I heard this voice said, I'm Jesus. Now I'm here at your house, and you're telling me about the story I have. I don't even know you. And you're saying Jesus sent you so that I can regain my sight, right? And then he gets his sight back. That's a miracle happening right there. And he responds to it. He receives the gospel and he responds and he was baptized. Remember, baptism is a response to salvation, not a means to salvation. So he, then he was baptized. It says, for some days he is with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. Just picture it, right? This guy who's Jewish in nature, he knows all the Old Testament scriptures, prophets, uh, prophecies even, right? And like beforehand, he was so zealous to persecute those who would say Jesus is the way. Now all of a sudden, the light's turned on. And he sees the Old Testament in a new way. This is pointed to Jesus the whole time. Like he would know all these things that it would relate to. But just imagine the scene. If you're a disciple, all of a sudden this guy who hates Jesus or used to hate Jesus comes up, starts preaching Jesus. You're like, whoa. Like, I don't know. Like sometimes uh, if you've been in the church any length of time or even maybe you yourself, I've seen it before. I even kind of was this way. You give your life to Jesus, you get so serious, you're so on fire. You're like, let's go tell everybody. Or I don't care what it is. And that's a good, like, desire to have but sometimes like you, you need to chill out man like you, you don't know right like, you don't know what philippians 4 13 means Just go out there and shout it off the rooftop or um habakkuk chapter one um that whole thing that you won't believe what god's gonna do because it's gonna be so great like, you don't know what you're talking about but paul i think he does but just imagine being the disciples hearing him start to speak and preach um and it says, he immediately proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the Son of God. Verse 21, it says, and all who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. His eyes are open. He sees things differently now. And it says, when many days had passed, this is verse 23, the Jews plotted to kill him. They don't like him. This guy's a traitor. He used to be our number one soldier, frontline guy. Put out Saul. He'll take care of business for sure. He'll do that. Well, now he's turned on them. Now he's proclaiming Jesus. So, of course, they, they want to kill him. They just they like to kill anyone who goes against them, right? Verse 24, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night, let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. So they're getting Saul out of there. Like, hey man, you're like, um, what do you call it? Like FBI most wanted around here. We need to get you out of here. Um, verse 26, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. Like, hey guys, what's up? I love Jesus. <laughs> and he says, and all of them were afraid of him. <laughs> like, Saul, whoa, easy, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know about you. You wanted to kill me the other day. And now you're here and you want to be a part of us. This doesn't make any sense. But he says, they're all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him and how at Damascus had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea, sent him off to Tarsus. Tarsus. Verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, had peace and was being built up, right? Gaining Saul was a huge win for the kingdom of God. Not that God needed him, but man, God's going to use him powerfully. He has changed his life dramatically from being a persecutor of the church, one who would murder Christians, throw Christians in jail, to now all of a sudden he's actually building the church up. And it says, "...in walking in fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit." It, this is the church, multiplied, right? 
So here's the point here is that everything in a moment can change when Jesus comes into the picture. Paul, we read Philippians, and you're like, man, he's so amazing, I could never be like Paul. But Paul is just a man like you and I, full of sin. He was selfish in his ways, pursuing his own desires, what he thought was true, and he was pursuing it more than you and I. You might be like, oh, I've pursued some worldliness. Paul killed people, or at the very least said, hey, you, go kill that guy. He, he say, Jesus, yeah, uh, go kill him. Put him in prison, right? Whatever it is. It's like, have you done that kind of stuff, right? And even if you've done the worst of the worst, you just should get from this message that God can totally change things around in, the, in just a moment if you just accept the gospel. The gospel changes people. And it's not just, oh, I accepted some good news. It's Jesus changes people. Everything that he did changes eternity. And you guys just really, you, you need to know that. And from this day forward with Paul, Saul, things were never the same again. Now I'm definitely out of time and I have way more to cover, but I'll, I'll hit a few things. Timothy says that he was there, right? Paul and Timothy. Well, Paul, uh, Timothy comes into the picture. Acts chapter 16. Paul's now a Jesus freak. He's on mission. He takes three journeys, missionary journeys as they call them, around. Like literally, he goes through some of Israel for sure, but he literally makes his way over to Europe um, a few times here and, and a whole bunch of other places. Um, but he's going on these, this missionary journey, Acts chapter 16, verse 1. It says, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by brothers at Lystra and Iconium. So Paul's on this missionary journey. He meets Timothy along the way. Scriptures tell us, history tells us, Timothy was a young man compared to Paul. Paul would be older, wiser, if you will. He's like the pastor. And even at times, Paul says, I consider Timothy a son. To me, like it's a father-son relationship going on. And he meets Timothy, hears about him. Um, he, he's a believer. And then it says, verse 3, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. Something in him. I want you to come along. Maybe he saw something and said, I want you to come alongside so that you can learn more. I think that could definitely be the case. Or maybe he saw giftings in Timothy that he's like, hey, you're, you're valuable. You got more than you think you got. Like, you got the Holy Spirit in you. And man, like, if we just get you some experience and out there and living with the Holy Spirit and being Spirit-filled, man, God's got some some things he's going to do. We don't know exactly what it is, but he wanted him to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him. And you're like, wow, that's an extreme. Because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew his father was a Greek. And it's basically like, hey, I know I'm in a house divided, but I'm team Jesus is kind of what he was saying, I guess. And verse 4 says, As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them, um, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. They, Timothy joins the team, and they start um, preaching God's word and continuing the work of God. And all of a sudden, the church continues to multiply. And that's what happens when people receive the gospel. Where it's like, hey, you're a sinner. You're messed up. I know. So was I. But Jesus saved me. And Jesus wants to change me into a new creation to be reborn. And then all of a sudden you join a church, whether it's here or a different church, the global church, right? And all of a sudden it multiplies because God's gifted each and every one of us with something. He wants to use each and every one of us in specific ways, in specific times and places, Right? So when you think, oh, just an accident, my parents didn't want me, they didn't plan me, well, God knew who he was creating. He has something for you. And when you let Jesus into your life, all of a sudden, now you're living for the gospel. Right? Now you're living for the king of kings. And all of a sudden, you're going to see it multiply. And the last thing I'll hit here, I don't know, man, we won't get through this, but Philippi, right? So we got Paul and Timothy, they're now Jesus freaks going hard um, for the Lord. And then Philippi. So where did Philippi come into this whole situation? Well, Philippi was actually a place in Europe um, beforehand. I forget what it was called, um, the English equivalents like river, city of rivers or whatever. Um, but then it was later changed to the name Philippi because Philip, um, Father Philip, I don't know what his title is, 
who is actually the father of Alexander the Great, he went to Philippi and then they changed the name from um, this river city to Philippi. And so that's part of the, the history there. Well, it was a very Greek place, right? It's not Christian, it's not Jewish. It's like, it's the worldly stuff, if you will. And so there's this place and they're on a, on a mission, Paul, Timothy, Silas, there's some other guys with them and they're traveling Around. Now they go to one place, I forget the name of it, but while they're there, the Holy Spirit intervenes and Paul has a vision. And he has a vision of a man that says, come to Macedonia. Macedonia is where Philippi would be, like Macedonia would be like, come to Texas, right? And then Philippi would be like, come to Hutto. I don't, you know, um, of course, Macedonia is probably nowhere near the size of Texas because Texas is ridiculously big. But it says, come to Macedonia and help us. Paul thought like, well, we got to go. And so they go to Macedonia, they go to Philippi, and they meet this woman, um, Lydia, who becomes the first um, Christian convert in Europe, um, that, as far as we know. And then from there, all of a sudden, the church starts to grow there. And so he would spend some time there, and then he would start to actually build this church. And again, it's very unlike Paul. Like His, his resume would say that he would never minister to Gentiles, Greeks, no way, like all this stuff. But now here he is starting a church in a primarily Gentile um, community, right? And so then he starts the church at Philippi, but it, it's not just that. There's so many things that happen there. Number one, um, Lydia, she gives her life to the Lord. There's another instance where there's this demon-possessed girl. This one's a fun one. I wish I was there to see it, or maybe when we get to heaven, we can hit this on the replay. But um, there's a demon-possessed girl, and she is, she's a fortune teller, essentially. And so her master, whoever it is, the guy who like, owns her, is using her to make money. Like, hey, you go out and tell the future uh, to these people, and you'll amaze them. They'll pay you money. I'll be rich. This is going to be amazing, right? Well, anyways, they're bothering um, Paul and the disciples and saying stuff like, oh, go away, you uh, believers of the Son of God type stuff. And Paul is fed up with it and literally cast out this uh, demonic spirit. Like that's, it's just, I want to see that because Paul just like, would you shut up already in the name of Jesus, come out. And then all of a sudden the spirit leaves for real. And then they want to persecute him. They throw Paul and, and these guys in prison because they have now disrupted this guy's financial income because he cast out a demon. That's literally what happens. Well, they go to prison and then they're praying, they're singing songs, right? I don't know if you've ever been to prison or jail. I don't recommend it. I've heard things. Um, I may have been there for a couple of days at one point, but nobody's singing songs, um, at least not on day one. Like, like, this sucks, this is terrible, right? Maybe you guys who are in there for life, they're like, you know what? This is home, baby, praise. I don't know, but it's like no one's singing songs. Paul, Timothy, these guys are in prison. They're singing songs, they're praying. All of a sudden, there's this huge earthquake that, the cell doors break open and you would think this is of the lord guys we got to make our escape right now but what happens there's a philippian jailer in there right the doors bust open the lights like and they didn't have electricity so i don't know what their light situation was but maybe the little candles blew out like one of those spooky movies just um couldn't see anything. He thinks the prisoners escaped. The Philippian jailer thinks they escaped. So what does he do? You guys know this story? He pulls out his sword and he's about to kill himself. And then Paul says, wait, wait, we're all here. Don't do that, right? And then all of a sudden he tells him the gospel of Jesus, right? Because it's like, why would you not run away, right? Why would you stay here to save my life when you could have ran away. He tells him the gospel, this Philippian jailer receives the Lord, right? And this is literally how the church at Philippi started. And so I got to end here because we're literally out of time. Um, and I want to do communion before we um, get out of here. But the church at Philippi, man, it's a, it's a special place to, to Paul for sure. And so he's come from this, this crazy background He's gone out there, he sees the Lord doing a work, and all of a sudden these people are starting to believe in Jesus. And it's like a little um, fervent community in Philippi, all for Jesus. Not Jewish people, it's not these religious background people, it's just Gentiles getting to know Jesus. And so when Paul is writing this church, you got to just imagine, it's like Paul loves them. And, and here's the thing that you got to know about Philippians. Paul is in jail or prison again. He wasn't, never, didn't just go once or twice, I think he went three or four times at least, um, that we know of. 
Uh, and he's in prison again, and he's writing the church of Philippi, and he's writing them. And so when we have that perspective, it's like, man, like, I don't know, it's like a, um, a church planter in a sense, writing this church that, man, I love you guys. I got some things I want to say to you guys. Um, and, and so when we hear it, it's like, let's listen up. It's like this is a guy who cares about them deeply, has been through things with them, going through things now. He's in prison. You might think that Paul would say, this is the worst. Get me out of here, guys. Hey, break me out. This is the guard schedule. I shouldn't be in here for preaching Jesus. Like, You know what I mean? But Paul actually writes them at one point. He says, he's all, uh, and I'll read it to you. His verse 1 says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, being imprisoned, he says, has really served to advance the gospel. And again, we're talking about advance, and we want to advance the gospel. Man, I love that Paul's perspective is advance the gospel, because the gospel is everything. Paul writes in Romans 1.16, he says, the gospel is the power of God to salvation, right? And he says that I'm unashamed. And so my encouragement to you and I, anyone joining us online today or listening to this later, literally our lives are to be about Jesus, I don't know how to tell you what that's going to look like. Does that mean you're going to go on missionary journeys like Paul? Maybe, maybe not. But the church at Philippi even, he writes at one point that the church at Philippi cared so much about Paul that when he was on other missionary journeys, he goes, he writes a letter to the church at Corinth um, in 2 Corinthians. He writes a letter to them. He's like, man, I was in need and you didn't supply any of my needs. But the church at Philippi, the ones from Macedonia, they did. And, right? and he, Paul kind of like saying like, I don't know, but we see Church of Philippi, like, they love Paul. They support his ministry. And so what your plan for your life, what God has, I don't know. Maybe you're like the Church of Philippi supporting missionaries like Paul that would go out and about. Maybe you're supposed to be the Paul going out and about. Maybe you're a Timothy that's going to go out for a little bit, but then you're going to get planted, right? He actually becomes the pastor of a church. And he, Paul writes him a couple letters later called First and Second Timothy. They're great letters, and you should check them out. But... Here's the thing, God has something for you. He loves you. You're not too far gone. You haven't messed things up too much that he can't forgive you. Are there consequences? Sure. You got to understand, just because you gave your life to Jesus doesn't mean you're gonna ha not going to have to go serve your sentence if that happens or pay your ticket for speeding, right? It's like there's consequences to what we do. But are we forgiven in the sight of God when we accept Jesus? Yes. And that's a beautiful amazing, freeing place to be. And when we can start to see the gospel more clearly, I think we'll be like Paul, where we're just like, man, I'm, I'm going to live for Jesus at all costs, no matter what. And if I end up in prison, praise God. If I'm not in prison, praise God. But man, we're going to praise God. Amen? Um, so yeah, I had a lot more I wanted to get into, but uh, we're going to pray. We're going to get into communion, I think. Are there, is there communion cups in that? Can you check? Okay, cool. Sometimes... Um, um, and then we'll pass this out. Just want you to know communion is a special sacred time for us. We remember the gospel when we're taking communion. And if you're not a believer in Jesus, you haven't accepted the gospel, meaning you haven't repented from your old ways and believed in Jesus, we want to ask that you do not take a cup. This is not a place to try to fit in. It's just something that, is, that means a lot to us. When we remember the gospel, we remember his life, death, burial, and resurrection. Um, but if today, maybe you came in and you don't believe in Jesus, or you didn't, and now you're like, you know what, I, I have felt this tugging on my heart, and that I, I need to repent of my sins, and I've been going the wrong direction, and I, I feel like the light came on today, and you're like, I want to give my life to Jesus. Well, make today the first day that you take communion as a believer in Jesus, and then and join us. But this is not something to feel peer pressured into. And so as what we'll, we'll do, and we do um, when we take communion is we'll have a song of worship. You guys can take communion um, by yourselves. If you have a spouse, you can take communion with your spouse. You're free to go towards the back if you want to stand up or kneel down um, off to the side. Have a moment with the Lord, but you're going to take communion on your own. We're not going to come up here and say, now we're going to take the cracker. Now we're going to take the juice, but just take it on your own time. We'll have one communion song by the time that communion song is over, um, the idea is that we'll, we'll be done with communion. We ask that you would stand up 
um, after you take communion kind of as a signal just for all of us like hey I've taken communion and now we want to stand together and we're going to end service with one extra worship song and we're going to praise Jesus starting our week out um, just on a high note lifting his name high you guys cool with that so father we thank you for your word we thank you for sending your son for us to die for us that you would forgive us that you would set us free God and we just pray God that in this moment that we would take time to remember your sacrifice for us in a very personal way Lord you died for us Lord you bore our sins you became our sin you took our punishment on the cross God and help us to remember that reflect on that and Lord that we would be grateful and as we take communion, Lord, I pray we'd remember that we'd repent if necessary, if we find sin in us, God, that we haven't repented of and things that are just tripping us up that we're keeping in our life, God. I pray that we would repent of those things and, God, that we would come to you and that we would rejoice in the good news, the gospel of Jesus here. And so we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.